In the early 90s, John Singleton would drop what would earn him an Academy Award nomination for Best Director with his introductory film, Boys in the Hood. From its unconventional title to its bold cinematography, Boys in the Hood garnered both critical and commercial acclaim, putting John Singleton's name out there into the cinesphere and made him an almost overnight celebrity. At just 24 years old, he was ready to follow in the footsteps of some of his predecessors and inspirations like Steven Spielberg and Spike Lee. As a kid, he used cinema as an escape from the drugs, gangs, and violence common within the low-income black neighborhoods of California, so it only made sense that he'd inevitably find himself attending USC's School of Cinematic Arts. While there, he worked part-time as a PA, where he met Lawrence Fishburne, and a few years later, he just so happened to be at the Arsenio Hall show, where he'd meet Ice Cube of NWA. By then, he was still workshopping his movie, but was so sure he wanted Fishburne and Ice Cube to have starring roles after writing parts that catered to their respective strengths. Which was a great call because after the success of Boys in the Hood and Singleton's meteoric rise, he had the corporate backing to make just about whatever he wanted. But rather than doing that, he chose to keep the focus of his early work on the black experience in America, and while there is no singular monolithic experience that could be summed up in TV or film, he did his best to embody the themes of strife, prejudice, and socioeconomic conditioning often seen within black communities. He made a career out of his love for storytelling and became one of the most influential black creatives ever until his untimely death in 2019. So what I want to do is take a look at the career of John Singleton and break down most of his major projects and ultimately what his lasting legacy is. And bear in mind that this is art, it's subjective. If your opinion or take is different than mine or someone else's, that's okay. Just leave it in the comments, but be respectful. But fair warning, due to the nature of most of these projects, it's gonna get political, and I know that ain't everybody's cup of tea, so if that's not your jam, you can come back next time where we'll probably be talking about giant anime titties or something, I don't know. But for everyone else, lights, camera, yeah. So we already talked about Boys in the Hood a little bit and the casting of Lawrence Fishburne and Ice Cube, but I need to point out that this is probably the film most personal to John Singleton in his entire filmography. The neighborhood is said to be one not too dissimilar to where he grew up, and most of the characters are based on people he actually knew, like Lawrence Fishburne's Furious being based on his own father. The casting of Ice Cube is interesting because bringing in musical artists is something that will go on to be a staple of Singleton's work, with the likes of Janet Jackson, Tupac, Busta Rhymes, Q-Tip, Ludacris, Andre 3000, Snoop Dogg, and Tyrese Gibson all making appearances. Another trend this film would unwittingly start is the collaborative trilogy of films starring Lawrence Fishburne and Angela Bassett with of course Boys in the Hood, the legendary What's Love Got to Do With It, and the super underrated Aquila and the Bee that made Kiki Palmer a black household name. The principal cast being rounded out by Cuba Gooding Jr. as Trey in his first leading role and Morris Chestnut as Ricky, who to this day, black women continue to thirst over. I mean, he ain't me, but he I, I guess. Boys in the Hood almost feels like a prelude to Baby Boy in the sense that it's a very small scale story that focuses on the hardships of living in the hood of LA and how that could affect not just someone's view of the world, but their potential future in that world. Los Angeles will become a favorite location of Singleton's work throughout his career because, well, they say to write what you know, and this is an environment that he's intimately familiar with. Every major US city kind of has its own culture and subcultures, and as someone from Houston, I don't know if I would want someone from Tackleberry, Montana to portray what life in H-Town is actually like, so I think he was the right guy to flesh out South Central. There's a focus on how the violence between black males is festered and perpetuated due to environmental factors like lackluster schooling, house negro cops, proximity to drugs and alcohol, etc. Which is usually told via expository dialogue through Furious. 
It's a bit of a mix between hard truths and Hotepian talking points, but Lawrence Fishburne has the charisma to really sell me on what he's saying, even if I don't necessarily agree with it. Speaking of charisma, Cuba Gooding Jr.'s Trey has a certain awkwardness to him that could have you thinking he was horribly miscast one second, and holy shit this dude is amazing the very next. It was very early in his career and we've seen what he's developed into since then, so I'm willing to look the other way while he was still figuring things out. His conversations with Furious reflect that of Singleton and his own father and touch on the themes of the movie like positive masculinity, self-empowerment, and de-escalation of violence. These talks help frame Trey as the main character, but it doesn't always feel like it. Even though he has the most screen time, I honestly was more interested in the perspectives of brothers Doughboy and Ricky. There was an interesting dichotomy between the two that helped visualize the different paths you could go down as a result of growing up in this kind of neighborhood. You could go the Doughboy route and ingratiate yourself into the trenches, or you could go the Ricky route and use whatever gifts you have to pull yourself out. Whether fairly or unfairly, it's pretty clear from how their mother treats them, which son she favors, and how that favoritism has an effect on their respective worldviews, with Ricky being the hopeful optimist and Doughboy being more of a realist. Their environment eventually does what it does and leads to the death of Ricky, which was inadvertently caused by an altercation escalated by Doughboy. Doughboy goes to seek revenge, but Trey can't bring himself to perpetuate the cycle of violence after the numerous conversations with his father. But as stated earlier in the film, someone like Doughboy doesn't have a strong masculine figure in his life to guide him, which inevitably leads him down the path of vengeance. Again, I don't necessarily agree with everything this movie is insinuating, but it's all subjective at the end of the day. I do, however, agree with the movie's final thesis, as stated by Doughboy. Either they don't know, don't show, or don't care about what's going on in the hood. The point of what he's saying is that the lives of these young black men are so swept under the rug by America that what happened to Ricky, what has happened to countless young black men in America, isn't even a blip on the radar of the cultural zeitgeist. It could also be read as a way to reach out to other black creatives and encourage them to authentically tell our stories and experiences because to be frank, no one else will. Right before the end, there's an overlay stating that Doughboy was killed just a few weeks later, implying that the cycle of violence marches on and how the potential robbed of both Ricky and Doughboy reflects the lost potential of the dozens of black men killed every single day, whether they're the victim or the perpetrator. The film ending with the message, increase the peace, just in case it was too subtle for you to pick up on. Not only did this film help launch the acting careers of its three central characters, but I feel like I have to mention Nia Long and Regina King, who played supporting roles and who would eventually go on to have a reunion with Ice Cube in Friday, so that's nice. The film was a hit from top to bottom, and Singleton solidified himself as a hot commodity as a result. This led him to landing in the director's chair for Michael Jackson's Remember the Time music video the following year, where MJ would steal Eddie Murphy's queen right in front of the whole palace, but it's Michael Jackson, what can you really do? Anyway, I can't confirm it, but I'm guessing this new connection is how Singleton got in touch with Michael Jackson's sister Janet and how she was pegged to be the lead of his next upcoming film. As opposed to the male-centric cast of boys, Singleton wanted to tell his next story from the point of view of a woman, taking a softer approach while still treating it with the gravity it deserves. Despite numerous high-profile actresses auditioning for Justice, Singleton never really envisioned anybody other than Janet Jackson in the titular role. Obviously, he saw her for more than just her looks, but I gotta say it before we get too deep into this thing. Janet Jackson looks so so good in this movie like oh my god she is stunning no wonder she had them niggas screaming bloody murder on the stage i mean good lord anyway opposite janet was tupac fresh off his standout performance in juice to play lucky this would be the second time the singleton would place a rapper in a critical role and while the supporting cast is good the film is absolutely carried by the charisma and chemistry of its two leads 
This is a love story, so some of the dialogue can be a bit cheesy, but it's made all the more believable by Janet's sincerity and Tupac's magnetism. The arguments they have at the beginning of their road trip are electric enough to make Kendrick We Cry Together Lamar proud. Naturally, the two start off not being too fond of each other, but over the course of the film's runtime, they eventually grow to understand each other after bonding over their trauma. Justice's previous boyfriend was murdered right in front of her as a result of gun violence and has been left aimlessly in a state of depression, venting her thoughts and anxieties through her poetry. You get it, poetic justice. Lucky is struggling with what it means to be a good father to his young daughter and hopes to establish a more fulfilling career in order to take care of her. It just so happens that the two both need to get from Los Angeles to Oakland at the same time and then, boom road trip movie. Poetic Justice isn't as heavy handed with its themes as Boys was, which is why I don't think it did as well critically despite still making a decent profit. There are touches of trauma, parenthood, and romance, but I don't think it was quite enough for audiences. The poetry itself, written by Maya Angelou who makes an extended cameo, doesn't actually end up playing a huge role in the plot. It's really just a vehicle for Justice to express how she's feeling at that current moment. I mean, he's a rapper, she's a poet. There's a duality to that element that definitely feels underdeveloped and left me wanting more thematically. While the budding romance between Justice and Lucky is sweet, it just doesn't pack the same punch as Singleton's previous work did. And I hate to keep comparing it to Boys in the Hood, but it's almost impossible not to. When you have the kind of success that film gave him, everything you do afterwards is gonna be compared to that. It's like how M. Night Shyamalan can't get out of the shadow of the sixth sense no matter what he does. Again, Janet is great, but Tupac low-key stole the show with a range of emotions that I frankly wasn't sure he was even capable of. Ice Cube actually turned down the role because he wasn't sure he could believably pull it off. Pac definitely had a future in Hollywood had he not been taken away at such a young age. Poetic Justice isn't bad. The middle section with Regina King and her boyfriend is a bit annoying, which I think is supposed to be. The leads forgive each other a little too easily, but all in all, I think that maybe it could have been left in the oven for just a bit longer. And before we move on, I gotta say that not having some sort of Janet Jackson slash Tupac musical R&B pop slash rap collab has gotta be one of the biggest missed opportunities in all of Nigadom. Pac, if you're out there somewhere, it's not too late to come back. The game needs you, like really bad. And if you're not, then well, rest easy, my guy. I wanna get I'm almost embarrassed to admit it, but prior to doing the legwork for this video, I had never seen Higher Learning, like ever. I'd heard of it, but it just, it just didn't seem like my kind of thing, but boy was I wrong. Because I'd never seen it, it was so interesting seeing super young versions of famous actors like young Tyra Banks, young Jennifer Connelly, young Busta Rhymes, young Michael Rappaport, Jesus, I'd always assumed he was born middle-aged, and of course, young Mike Tomlin. We do not care. I'm kidding, I know that's Omar Epps. He'd already kind of had his big break with Juice, and now after being cast as Malik, the lead in this film, he was just taking the natural next step in his career. Although the film was shot at UCLA, it takes place at the fictional Columbus University, where the characters serve as a microcosm for different aspects of college life from the perspectives of three freshmen. Of course you have Malik who deals with the balancing act of being a student athlete. Early on, he definitely has a sense of entitlement by virtue of being a track star before realizing that there are no freebies in college. Both his time on the track, but especially his grades, were something that he'd have to earn, guided by the hand of his political science professor, played by Lawrence Fishburne, who more or less serves the same purpose as Furious did for Boys in the Hood. Secondary character Christy is a nice but naive young woman who, after suffering sexual assault on campus, struggles to come to terms with what happened to her, as well as rediscovering and exploring her own sexuality. 
of the main three characters, Christie's story is a bit undercooked, and there was definitely plenty of space to have more commentary on the very real and still prevalent issue of sexual assault. Probably could have cut Malik's romantic subplot down a little bit in my opinion. And finally, Remy is indicative of how the myth of the American dream directly leads to the isolation, alienation, and ultimately radicalization of young white men and how those feelings result in them going down far right rabbit holes. The sense that college and really life in general is already kind of self segregated by race and culture isn't lost on Remy. But he takes that idea to its logical extreme when he joins a group of skinheads in order to find his place in the world. The black militants of Malik's story, the liberal feminism of Christie's story, and the extreme white identitarian stance of Remy's story with just a sprinkle of police ineptitude makes for an interesting melting pot of themes and ideas that I think Singleton managed to pull off about as well as he could. Despite mixed reviews at the time, I think the film aged really well considering that the themes are still at the forefront of American social and political commentary almost 30 years later and that unfortunately does take into account the inclusion of a school shooting which have only increased exponentially since the 1990s. It's hard to call higher learning a financial flop because I looked everywhere and I couldn't find out how much this movie cost to make, but if audience reception and box office was anything to go by, I'm guessing it did just okay. There's a maturity to this film not just in terms of thematic relevance, but filmmaking as well. I saw this as a graduation of sorts for Singleton as a filmmaker in the sense that it feels like he could tell more than just Afrocentric stories, but any story if given the opportunity. His willingness to dive into the perspectives of three very different characters of three very different backgrounds in a sincere way serves as a testament to his ability as a writer and director. The film of course ending with one of Singleton's signature messages, unlearn which I guess is telling the audience to unlearn preconceived notions or to unlearn hate, I guess. <laughs> so what's next? Okay, I have another confession. Prior to doing the research for this video, I had never seen or even heard of Rosewood, like literally not one time, never even heard of it. And granted, it is a little bit before my time, but the way it flew under my radar might just be indicative to how this film is overlooked when it comes to John Singleton's career as a whole. He's no stranger to exploring black trauma, but maybe it was because of the heavy subject matter that it didn't do quite as well critically or commercially as most of his films. As where I couldn't definitively call higher learning a flop, the results here are a lot more concrete. Having decent reviews and a star-studded cast including the likes of Bing Rames, Don Cheadle, John Voight, Esther Roll, and Michael Rooker weren't enough to save Rosewood from less than flattering reviews. And it's very possible that because this was inspired by true events, the brutality of what happened to these people hit a little too close to home and it's hard to look back at America's all too familiar history of racial violence. For example, I thought 12 Years a Slave was an amazing, well-made piece of cinema, but I will never watch it again because of how visceral and how raw it left me feeling by the time the credits rolled, and I think subconsciously that lowered its overall rating in my head because I know how sensitive I am when it comes to that particular topic. I can watch something like Django Unchained because it frames itself as ridiculous and over the top while still addressing a serious subject matter, but when a film plays it completely straight, it's just a lot for me. Rosewood covers the real life 1923 massacre in Levy County, Florida in which a white mob killed as many as 150 black people according to eyewitness accounts. Prior to this attack, the titular town of Rosewood was about the best case scenario you can think of when it comes to an integrated community given the time period. However, even in its earlier, more peaceful portions of the film, there's still a palpable tension rising just beneath the surface of this supposed peace that can still be felt by the town's inhabitants despite the can't we all just get along facade. 
The white people in this town understand their privilege and are more than willing to weaponize it against their black co-inhabitants seemingly on a whim. There's a commentary here on how white women in particular will lie and utilize their faux tears to gain the sympathy of white men in order to have them unleash their pent up aggression on whatever innocent black man happens to be caught in the crosshairs of this, pardon my French, lying white bitch. And it's not a nothing burger issue, it's a problem that still persists and one that we still have to deal with today. I don't know how many different versions of Barbecue Becky we have to see before we're allowed to say that there's an issue, but it affects your everyday run-of-the-mill brothers to Hall of Fame wide receivers like Terrell Owens. Thankfully, most of those situations today end up resolving without anybody ending up dead a la Emmett Till because everyone's got a camera in their pocket, but in the time of Rosewood, all it takes is one lying white woman to completely undo the uneasy harmony between the citizens of this town. Her cries for affection aren't reciprocated by her lover, who only views her as some afternoon delight and beats her to make her remember her place. This level of violence committed against her leaves her feeling lesser than, dehumanized. For whatever reason in her mind, these types of feelings and this level of brutality should only be reserved for those she views as lesser than herself, black people. So in an effort to transmit that pain onto someone else, she concocts a lie saying that she was sexually assaulted and beaten by a black man, putting every white man in town into a feeding frenzy as they search for the alleged culprit. They begin wrangling up pretty much any black man that they can find without so much as a trial or evidence and start killing and lynching them before eventually moving on to women and children, putting every black citizen in immediate danger. The way these white men almost instantly deputize themselves into being judge, jury, and executioner speaks to the fact that the peace between them was never really all that legit and they were just looking for any excuse to burn down this self-sufficient black town not too dissimilar to the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. But not every white person here is supposed to be viewed as bad. John Voight's character is portrayed as one of the good ones due to how he ultimately helped save the surviving black citizens, but considering how hard he looked the other way when this whole thing first started popping off, I personally find it hard to empathize with him considering he only really got involved once the lives of his own family were threatened. The black children who survived would go on to give their testimony on the events that transpired decades later in order to be granted reparations by the state, going to show that the same way violence can be passed down from one generation to the next, so can trauma. Speaking of the next generation, So this movie is one of the first legacy sequels we've seen in contemporary Hollywood back before legacy sequels were even a routine thing. Although I'm not all that familiar with the original works, so it's hard to say if there's any true overlap between the two aside from the addition of Richard Roundtree in a minor role. 2000 Shaft follows the nephew of John Shaft from the original films and short-lived TV series and serves as a sort of contemporary update on the black exploitation of its era. Samuel Jackson's new Shaft, sporting the worst goatee of all time, does a fine enough job in the role, but to me, the rest of this feels disappointing. It feels like just a movie, and considering that John Singleton wrote, produced, and directed it, it shouldn't leave me feeling underwhelmed. With a cast that includes Tony Collette, Christian Bale, Jeffrey Wright, and Vanessa Williams, the fact that this movie is giving made for TV is kind of a huge letdown. There are some minor themes of affluent nepotism, a broken justice system, and hypermasculinity, but they aren't prevalent enough to be anything more than just a footnote. The story is about Shaft going above and beyond the confines of the NYPD to bring the perpetrator of a hate crime to justice after two years on the run from the law due to the privilege literally afforded to him by his rich father, and more or less, it plays out exactly how you think it will. And I guess that's enough for some people because it got decent reviews and did well at the box office, but it just left me wanting more. Maybe I just didn't get it or maybe you have to have seen the originals from back in the day to really have a foundation for what this movie is going for, which I haven't, but 
I just don't have much to say about Shaft, unfortunately. I expected more, but it's just a movie. You know why? You just a baby boy. You not the real mother Now, this movie was a return to form for Singleton. It's actually the first of his films that I've ever seen in my life. Well, the BET version that they played a thousand times a day, but I got a much better picture after seeing the theatrical version. Baby Boy almost feels like the spiritual successor to Boys in the Hood in the way it focuses on a young man from South Central LA just trying to find his place in the world, but puts an emphasis on black fatherhood and what it means to be a man. Singleton cast Tyrese Gibson as the lead character Jody, a role that was actually written for Tupac prior to his death. Tyrese initially turned down the role multiple times because he wanted to focus on his budding music career, but finally caved due to Singleton's persistence. Although he did pay homage to Pac in the set decor of Jody's room, so that's a nice touch. Singleton also cast AJ Johnson as Jody's mom Juanita, Omar Gooding as Jody's homeboy P, Snoop Dogg in an antagonistic role as Rodney, brought back Bing Rames as Juanita's boyfriend Melvin, and in her coming out party, he cast Taraji P. Henson as Jody's love interest, Yvette. Taraji is so ridiculously incredible in this movie. Singleton definitely hit a home run casting her in a prominent role for the film. And despite this being his first leading role, I honestly think this is the best performance Tyrese has ever given in his career. I mean, he's not exactly known for his range, but the way he manages to use his charisma to perfectly encapsulate the comedy, tragedy, and uncertainty of the black male experience into one character is nothing to scoff at. These character elements within Jody serve as a microcosm for the greater themes of the film. The dichotomy between being a mama's boy and the reality of being a baby daddy to two different women forces Jody to have to grow up before he has the emotional maturity to do so. He gets a push from Melvin as he feels like his mother's new boyfriend is moving in on his territory and thinks that she doesn't have room in her life for more than one man, grinding against his low-key Oedipus complex and possessive nature. That possessiveness extends to his relationship with Yvette and his other baby mama, Peanut. The way Jody tries to control their every move while having no issues sleeping around with other women goes to show just how much his maturation has been stunted, in part due to the circumstances of his upbringing. The baby girl he has with Peanut is younger than his son Jojo that he has with Yvette, so it's implied that he cheated on her with Peanut at some point, but because Yvette is so in love with him, she forgives him all too easily and Jody learns nothing from his poor decisions. Something eventually does click for him as he comes to the realization that he needs to provide for Yvette and his kids and really starts to hustle after feeling emasculated by the presence of Melvin but continues to cheat on Yvette anyway because niggas ain't shit. He and P are in similar situations living in someone else's house and have to have an honest conversation about their manhood, something all too many young black men have to reconcile with eventually. Although P's living situation is due to lack of alternatives, Jody's is completely by choice. He could easily live with Yvette and Jojo if he wanted to and solidify his own family, but just hasn't had that push from the nest. His self-interest just won't allow him to take that next step. Melvin tries to pass on some OG wisdom to Jody, but he isn't hearing it because Melvin is the first person to truly challenge Jody's immaturity. He doesn't have the predisposition of a mother's love like Juanita, so he can be real with Jody in a way that she can't. His opposition to Melvin is reflected by the arrival of Rodney, one of Yvette's old boyfriends who's fresh out of jail and who makes himself at home at her place after an intense fight leads to Jody and Yvette breaking up. Melvin's thugged out days are long behind him, but Rodney is still in his prime and serves as an antagonistic yet galvanizing force to bring Jody and Yvette back together and makes them realize what's important to them, especially after Yvette is almost assaulted and Jody is almost shot in a drive-by. Snoop isn't an actor by trade, but does a great job harnessing that sinister aura that audiences would go on to see in his later performance in Bones and does a lot with the screen time he's actually given. He inevitably meets his end at the hands of Jody and P, and even after not having much of an alternative, this causes Jody to reel with guilt because he doesn't view himself as a killer. This isn't the future he envisioned. 
He has a great scene with Melvin that I love because there's no dialogue between them. It's just two guys, one who's in the thick of it and one who's been through it all already and their eyes and body language convey everything that needs to be said in that moment of vulnerability. Despite being at each other's throats the whole movie, Melvin really did just want to help Jody. He wanted to give him the positive male role model and guidance that a lot of directionless young men don't have in their lives and the two build a newfound respect for one another out of a mutual love for Juanita. This new clarity and lease on life rolls over to Yvette as he finally becomes the man he's been struggling to be, a baby boy no more. Roger Ebert pretty much hit the nail on the head when he said, Baby Boy doesn't fall back on easy liberal finger pointing. There are no white people in this movie, no simplistic blaming of others. The adults in Jody's life blame him for his own troubles, and they should. Despite things like systemic racism playing a major factor into the lives of young black men, there's still a certain amount of accountability we have to have for ourselves and for those who are looking towards us to provide despite our circumstances. And it's up to all of us to go out there every day and get it how you live. Baby Boy may not bluntly end on that message, but I do think that's the lesson that Singleton is trying to imbue within the audience. The film got mixed reviews at the time and it didn't exactly blow up the box office, but it definitely showed that Singleton hadn't lost his touch and that he still had it and it solidified Tyrese as a mainstay of his work, which we'll get to in a sec. But first, if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I'm trying to get this channel off the ground, so if you want to help support in a free and easy way, you can click the like and subscribe buttons for me to let the YouTube algorithm know to spread this video to as many people as possible. Again, I cannot thank y'all enough for helping me out. I appreciate that. And who knows, maybe if enough people like it, maybe it'll spread fast and furiously. Too Fast Too Furious is the reason my dream car is a Nissan Skyline. It has been since 2003. If you watch my Sons of Anarchy video, part two coming soon, then you know that I'm really into motorcycles, but I would trade my bike away in a heartbeat for a Skyline. They're almost impossible to find in the States unless you know the right people and you got the right money. And I can't help but feel like this movie is at least partially responsible for that scarcity. Singleton was brought on to follow up the at the time critically underrated The Fast and the Furious, going from his old stomping grounds in South Central to taking his talents to South Beach. A script had been written in the event that Vin Diesel would reprise his role as Dom Toretto, which he didn't, not yet anyway. So to have someone play opposite Paul Walker's Brian O'Connor, Singleton cast Tyrese as one of Brian's old pals, Roman Pierce, aka Rome. Singleton cited Top Gun as a key influence for Too Fast, so the tension turned romance between the two leads is something that audiences would have to buy into if the film was going to work, and thankfully, Tyrese and Paul Walker had tremendous chemistry with each other, giving us plenty of meme-worthy moments like this. He's over there, don't look. Drop it, I don't want to talk about it. Drop it, hell? I want to hear about this, homie. I said forget about it, cuz. Their bromance is a lot less melodramatic than that of Brian and Dom's. It's actually much more humorous thanks to Tyrese's comedic timing that at times makes them seem like siblings and at others makes them seem like an old married couple. Their dynamic absolutely carries this movie even when the story is a bit lacking. Ben from Canada made a fantastic and hilarious video essay on that very dynamic, which I'll link in the description below. I like the fact that it retroactively explains why Brian let Dom go at the end of the first movie. In part, feeling guilty about Rome getting busted for stolen parts and having to go to jail for years with Brian being unable to help him, giving some added weight to his inevitable reunion with Dom. Singleton, of course, at this point was well known for casting rappers and singers in his productions, so after Ja Rule turned down a chance to reprise his role from the first movie, Where is Ja? He cast Ludacris in the role of Tej, adding another layer of street cred to the project. He even brought back Cole Hauser as the villain who actually played the skinhead leader guy in Higher Learning, so that just goes to show you how Singleton kept great relationships with his actors over the years. 
Oh, and Ava Mendez is here too. She doesn't really do all that much, but damn is she nice to look at. Speaking of nice to look at, every car here is amazing. I already talked about the Skyline, but when you throw in the Evo, the Spider, the Muscle Cars, the S2000, the Gold Supra, oh my god, the Gold Supra. Too Fast, Too Furious probably has the best roster of cars in the whole franchise. The way Brian shows up in that Skyline at the beginning and is just instantly established as a legit threat to these other racers is so cool and secondarily demonstrates his growth as a driver since we last saw him. Unfortunately, that's about where the praise ends and the criticism begins. The cast is good, the cars are great, but the rest of Too Fast leaves a lot to be desired. Don't get me wrong, every movie in this franchise is dumb, but the reasoning for getting these guys to drive these tuners is so stupid and cobbled together that it's almost impossible to take seriously. The other movies in the franchise have a sense of self-awareness that this movie lacks. They're popcorn movies and they're fun, but sheesh, you gotta turn your brain all the way off to enjoy this one. And the editing during the action sequences is probably the worst in the franchise. The camera refuses to hold on one shot for more than a second and a half before the next cut, and it's difficult for the audience to tell what's actually happening or where the characters even are. I get that most of that was done to cover up for the fact that these actors weren't really driving these cars, except for this awesome power slide, apparently Paul Walker really did that, but it doesn't make for a pleasant viewing experience. I won't harp on it too long, but in the same way that Shaft felt like just a movie, Too Fast Too Furious feels like just a dumb yet fun movie, and prior to Fate and F9 was my least favorite in the entire Fast saga. Basically, it's a fun time if you shift your lizard brain into turbo, and critics seem to agree with me as the film received mostly negative reviews in spite of a strong box office. However, it did lay the groundwork for bringing back Tyrese and Ludacris as future pillars of the franchise going forward, so John Singleton deserves credit for that despite my feelings towards this film in isolation. The Fast and Furious movies have always been about family at their core, but this next film is definitively the most family focused out of John Singleton's entire filmography. So when I initially conceptualized this video, I wanted to make a 10 to 15 ish minute video about four brothers in a similar vein to one of my other one off video essays. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that talking about John Singleton's total body of work as opposed to one film would not only be a greater challenge, but a greater way for me to show my appreciation for a creative that inspired me to chase my own creative dreams. And it all started with this film. Four Brothers is ultimately the story about how it sometimes takes a tragedy to bring a family together. After the murder of a woman named Evelyn Mercer during a robbery, her adoptive sons reunite in their native city of Detroit for her funeral and to investigate who pulled the trigger. This film's co-leads include Garrett Hudland as burnout rock star Jack, the return of Tyrese Gibson as Pretty Boy Angel, the inclusion of Andre 3000 as Family Man Jerry, and Mark Wahlberg as the ill-mannered hothead Bobby. Detroit is almost a character in its own right, with the way the story is kept on a ground level, really putting the audience into the heart of the Motor City alongside the rest of the cast. Their fiery temperament contrasted with the frozen cold setting gives the film a unique identity, separating it from the sunny skies of California that we've grown accustomed to in Singleton's work. The city is brought to life even more thanks to the soundtrack featuring a variety of Detroit artists such as The Four Tops, The Undisputed Truth, and The Temptations, placing the sounds of Motown front and center. The elements of modern era black exploitation seen in Shaft are migrated over to Four Brothers and refined by Singleton, which adds an extra layer of authenticity to this contemporary story evocative of those seen in the 70s. The supporting cast is rounded out by Tarashi P. Henson, Sofia Vergara, Chiwetel Ejiofor, Terrence Howard, and Fianula Flanagan. Flanagan specifically gives a very underrated performance in the film that often gets overlooked. 
She brings a certain amount of toughness alongside a certain amount of warmth that really leads you to believe that she could have feasibly raised four boys so malcontent that they were seen as lost causes by the foster system. Despite being dead within the first five minutes, her presence still looms heavy throughout the film. There's a scene where they're having Thanksgiving dinner and save for Bobby, they all have flashbacks about various conversations they had with her growing up. The reason Bobby doesn't see her is because he isn't ready to accept her death. The love and respect that the Mercer boys have for her is apparent in the way they start to flip the whole town upside down to get answers for her death. But this film is really sold on their relationships with each other. As someone with a lot of siblings, I can confirm that the way they interact is pretty accurate. Big ass teeth. Bite me? <laughs> You do got some big ass teeth, Jerry. <laughs> Bobby is the elder statesman of the group and often lambasts the masculinity of his younger brothers as a way to project his own insecurities. Jerry is resigned to taking care of his family and tries to stay out of the trouble his siblings cause, being the one with the most to lose. Angel is just as tough as Bobby, but has a one tracked mind when it comes to women that often leads to complications but i'm trouble. standing here telling y'all both right now i'm not going to see that girl and i'm not and with jack being the youngest it's clear that he looks up to his brothers but his implied troubled childhood keeps him from being quite as rugged as they are leading to even more emasculation from bobby although it does come from a place of love they eventually find out that the robbery was used as a cover for Evelyn's assassination, so even after taking out her killers, they have to investigate even further into who would want to do something like that to her. Naturally, there's a lot of friction between the Mercers and the cops who aren't much help. However, Terrence Howard's Detective Green does drop this absolute bar that I still repeat to this day. Go try and take on Detroit by your damn self. Keep knocking on the devil's door long enough and sooner or later somebody gonna answer you. That proverbial devil arrives in the form of Victor Sweet. Sweet represents everything wrong with the city. From controlling low-level gangsters on the street to cops to councilmen, he's got hands in everybody's pockets and rules the underworld of Detroit through fear. He had Evelyn killed after she broke up a big housing development that Sweet was supposed to financially benefit from after Jerry failed to pay him off. And because they kicked the hornet's nest too many times, his attention is now turned to the Mercers as he tries to have them killed as well. This massive shootout not only results in the death of Jack, but Green as well at the hands of his partner. With the corruption of the city oozing out from every corner, the brothers take the fight directly to Sweet personification of that very corruption. The way Sweet's men help Bobby stand up to Victor almost feels like the collective spirit of Detroit coming together to stand up to the very corruption itself. Four Brothers uses the vehicle of a tragic family drama to commentate on the metropolitan malfeasance present not just within Detroit, but arguably every major city, while still keeping that familial element at its core. It shows how the degradation and greed from the people at the top affects the lives of the people just trying to make it at the bottom. No one ever seems to mention that when it comes to this movie because the message gets lost in the action, but I'm willing to bet that's what screenwriters David Elliott and Paul Lovett had in mind when they wrote the script. It's a shame that it sometimes takes tragedy and loss to bring a family together. However, I can't help but smile at the very end when Bobby finally sees Evelyn after both accepting and avenging her death. So fun fact, this is actually not the first time that Terrence Howard and Taraji P. Henson would star in a movie together. Released just a few weeks prior to Four Brothers, there was this little known indie movie called, um, Okay, so while Hustle and Flow wasn't written or directed by Singleton, he did receive a producer credit after financing the movie. Director Craig Brewer and indie producer Stephanie Allen had trouble finding funding for the movie as movie studios didn't want to take a chance on the first time director telling a story that they didn't deem all that relatable or more importantly, profitable. The story is that of a pimp and drug dealer named DJ approaching a sort of midlife crisis. 
He's done nothing with his life but pimp and sling and has nothing to show for it, struggling just to make ends meet. The film opens with the DJ lecturing one of his lady friends named Nola on the importance of one's purpose, but it's clear he's trying to convince himself of what he's saying more than her. After seeing an old acquaintance from his neighborhood named Skinny Black make it big as a rapper, DJ aspires to be one himself as he has a proclivity for lyricism and hopes that Skinny Black can open some doors for him. So Alan, who had worked with Singleton in the past on Poetic Justice and Boys in the Hood, called him in as a favor and had him sit in on some of the pitch meetings to sort of help expedite the process. But after continuously getting rejected, Singleton lost his patience and put up the money himself. Not only did he serve as an executive producer, but also as a mentor for Brewer. Similar to how Singleton's first film covered life in South Central LA, the place where he grew up, Brewer's introductory film covers life in Memphis, Tennessee, the place where he grew up. Terrence Howard initially turned down the role of DJ as he didn't want to be typecast as a gangster adjacent, but after reading the script and understanding the complexity of the character, he changed his mind and accepted the part. Flanking Howard, you have a cast that includes, of course, Taraji K. Henson, Taryn Manning, Anthony Anderson, DJ Qualls, and of course, Ludacris in his second stint with working with Singleton. Despite being poor, DJ relies on the help of his friends and, um, lady friends to help him create and utilize a makeshift studio, going as far as using McDonald's cup holders as soundproofing in the hopes that they can produce a mixtape to give to Skinny Black and get put on the radio. If DJ can get radio play, it'll open him up to opportunities to make real money so he can provide for his lady friends as opposed to relying on their skill set to provide income. DJ uses his own life experience as a hustler to fuel his lyrics while his two friends Key and Shelby use their knowledge of electronics and music to engineer the songs and timid lady friend Suge uses her ability to sing to lay down some backing vocals. It shows just how much sacrifice is needed to succeed in the way that Key's relationship with his wife is strained due to him spending so much time in the studio and at the same time, someone like Shelby is indicative of how hungry your everyday man is for real, authentic hip hop so the pressure is on DJ to make this whole thing work. The whoop that trick scene alone is enough to induct hustle and flow into the Black Cinema Hall of Fame. The way the characters employ and galvanize their various skill sets to create this banger of a track is legendary and frankly should be studied in film schools. Everyone feels as if they're contributing and has a purpose for the project, save for Nola, who complains about her utilization as essentially an ATM machine for DJ. They get into a fight in which we really see the emotional depth of DJ's character. Pimping isn't something he's proud of or even something he wants to do, it's what he has to do to survive even though he hates it. The emasculation he feels from relying on his lady friends tricking and dancing isn't lost on him, but it's all he knows. As the old black proverb says, get it how you live, and that's exactly what he's trying to do. He doesn't necessarily want the fame that comes with being a prominent rapper, he wants the financial stability and is willing to do whatever it takes to get it. It's no coincidence that the movie takes place over the 4th of July weekend because what DJ is doing is essentially chasing the American dream of prosperity, to put your head down and grind and hustle and claw your way to success by any means necessary even if that means lying to your friends about how well you know a certain rapper in order to secure a meeting with him. But what he doesn't realize until it's all too late is that the American dream is a myth, a fabrication. Sure, you need to put in the work, but that doesn't always warrant a positive outcome. There are disappointments, there are setbacks, you need a tremendous amount of luck, and our heroes let us down. But to have a dream at all, to have aspirations, is the point of hustle and flow. In a weird meta sense, the way the characters had to scrap to get this mixtape produced is reflected in the way the filmmakers had to fight to get this movie off the ground. The same rejection they faced from the studios reflects how DJ is ultimately rejected by Skinny Black. And the way they had to rely on John Singleton to have their movie seen, DJ has to rely on Nola to have his mixtape heard, finally giving her the purpose she'd been looking for. 
The film resulted in the song It's Hard Out Here for a Pimp, winning an Oscar for Best Original Song, and Terrence Howard receiving an Oscar nomination for Best Actor. His performance no doubt launching the Terrence Howard main meme into the stratosphere of internet culture. Even with DJ locked up, Nola manages to achieve her goal as Whoop That Trick is a smashing success around Memphis, turning DJ into an overnight sensation, even resulting in the prison guards asking to get put on as he once did. The film concluding on its core theme. Well, you know what they say. Everybody gotta have a dream. But as any dreamer can tell you, where there are dreams, there are also nightmares. <sighs> All right, let's keep this short. Abduction is a very blatant and obvious attempt to cash in on Taylor Lautner's star power, granted to him by the insane Twilight hype of the early 2010s. I mean, it technically made money despite being critically panned, so it worked out or whatever. You have a decent cast, but Maria Bello and Jason Isaacs are wasted, and Alfred Molina and Sigourney Weaver were clearly phoning it in for a check. The script is so undercooked, predictable, sloppy, and is desperately trying to sequel bait by the end, but I did not care about a single one of these characters by the time it wrapped up. There was an opportunity to maybe give commentary on the nature of child abductions and how that affects both parent and child mixed in with some spy action, but nah, let's just make it a soulless tax write-off, they said. The only positive thing I have to say is that Taylor Lautner did a lot of his own stunts, which is more than I can say for most leading men, so there's that, I guess. This movie had nothing to say, so I have no idea why Singleton was involved here at all. I've watched his entire filmography for this video, and it doesn't have any of his signature Singletonisms, so I'm just gonna assume he was here getting a bag. I called Shafts just a movie, and Too Fast Too Furious just a dumb yet fun movie, but Abduction is just a bad movie. Well enough of that, let's talk about something good. So John Singleton was no stranger to working on TV. He reunited with Terrence Howard and Taraji P. Henson to direct an episode of Empire in 2015 and with Cuba Gooding Jr. in 2016 to direct an episode of American Crime Story. He did a few other things here and there for TV, but he never had anything he could call his own. That all changed in 2017 with his co-creation and ultimately his final production, Snowfall. It's almost cathartic that Snowfall ended up taking place back in Singleton's hometown of LA, where it all started for him in an era right before Boys in the Hood, set during the crack epidemic of the 1980s. Snowfall turned out to be a resounding success thanks to the foundation built by Singleton. With 50 episodes and 5 seasons having already aired and a 6th season on the way, the show was the number one topic of Black Twitter every time an episode drops, giving us our very own Breaking Bad to talk about. The series follows 19-year-old Franklin Saint, wonderfully portrayed by Damson Idris, as he grows from being a small-time weed dealer to one of the biggest drug kingpins in America, specializing in crack cocaine, otherwise known as rock. The show commentates on how every level of society was affected by the crack epidemic of the 80s, starting off in South Central and eventually making its way into white suburban areas, getting the police involved, cartels, drug lords, the media, and of course, the feds, the CIA specifically. The way the CIA used operatives to drop cocaine and guns into poor neighborhoods to be sold so they could fund proxy wars in Latin America are embodied in the character of Teddy, aka Reed, and perfectly depicts the real life crimes of the Reagan administration during this same time period. Franklin and Teddy maintain a strained, tenuous, yet profitable relationship which allows them both to benefit from the consumption of rock, with Franklin making money hand over fist for his organization and Teddy making money for the CIA to finance narco-terrorism. Even when they aren't together, their stories usually contrast each other in the sense that they're both having to navigate the dangers of their respective worlds. However, every move Franklin makes is out of a sense of capitalism and greed, and everything Teddy does is out of a misguided sense of patriotism. 
neither of them really seem to care all that much about the long-term consequences of destabilizing these poor, usually black neighborhoods, and how the influx of drugs and guns allows law enforcement to justify increased levels of police brutality and the violation of civil rights. Well, now that I say it out loud, they're actually not all that different, and you can tell from the way each of them gets progressively worse as the series goes on, from killing their friends, colleagues, and even their family to keep the operation going, each of their souls gets further and further eroded as this supposed war on drugs brings out the worst in them. The two men emblematic of the worst parts of American politics and economics. Reaganomics, if you will. It doesn't have to be said outright. But Snowfall commentates on how truly evil the CIA and Reagan administration were, all in the name of capitalism, nationalism, and white supremacy. Most of this character and thematic development comes in the latter half of the show, but unfortunately, John Singleton wouldn't be around to see it. But before we get to that, from worst to best, I want to give my ranking of all the projects we've talked about. But to keep it fair, I'm gonna omit Hustle and Flow since he didn't write or direct it. However, I will let you know where it would have landed had it made the list. At 10, we have Abduction. Um, everyone was there for a check. Need I say more? At 9, we have Shaft. It's a modern black exploitation feature that you watch once and then forget about forever. But you can probably appreciate it more if you've seen the original productions it was based on. In 8th, we have Rosewood. It's probably a lot better than I'm giving it credit for. There's a good movie in here somewhere, but just me personally, I'm so tired of watching black trauma films. I just don't have the emotional capacity for it anymore, but hey, if you like Rosewood, more power to you. Coming in 7th place is Too Fast, Too Furious. It should have been called Too Dumb, Too Fun, because that's exactly what it is, but I'm a sucker for car culture, and like it or not, this movie helped to lay the foundation for what we'd later see in the franchise. In the sixth spot, we have Poetic Justice. I really wish that Singleton would have given this film another once over, because there are some great ideas here that just need a little more development. But Janet Jackson and Tupac's on-screen chemistry is so palpable that it saves the movie from being mediocre. At number 5, we have Boys in the Hood. It's the film that started it all, made Singleton a force to be reckoned with, and did a great job at taking an introspective look at some of the shortcomings of young black men and what we could potentially do to, in his words, increase the peace. Coming in at 4 is Higher Learning. You could see the maturity within Singleton's writing as he addressed darker subject matter and gave different perspectives on American culture from the microcosm of the college experience, considering a bevy of POVs. The cinematography is probably the best in his work, so it was clear at this point that he had firmly established himself as a legit director. In third, we have four brothers. No matter the problems, no matter how long it's been since they've seen each other, the way the Mercer family comes together perfectly reflects the spirit of Detroit so well. Like the brothers, the people of the Motor City are gritty and scrappy, but always stand strong against a common enemy. It may be rough around the edges, but at the end of the day, it's Detroit versus everybody. So this is where Hustle and Flow would have gone. It's a fantastic film with a fantastic soundtrack and a fantastic message, but because it's not Singleton's vision, we gotta leave it off. Go watch it though, it's great. So taking the silver medal at two is Snowfall. Maybe it's because it's a long running series as opposed to a movie, but the development of the themes and the characters over the past few years has been peak TV. Singleton was only involved for the first two seasons, but I'd like to think that he'd be pleased with the evolution and direction of the show. It may be fictional, but it incorporates so many real life elements of its era that if you told me this was based on a true story, I would believe you. And finally, at number one, is Baby Boy. This film, in my opinion, is John Singleton's magnum opus. The narrative he managed to craft feels so real because it is real. Baby mama drama perpetuated by an immature young man is a story that is all too familiar to a lot of us and the ups and downs of that maturation process is familiar to even more of us. 
He went back to his roots in LA, got the best out of his actors, and affirmed his themes of black masculinity, self-empowerment, romance, trauma, and violence ubiquitous throughout his work, all in one movie. Baby Boy may get written off as a meme because of BET, but it truly is cinema. Prior to the third season of Snowfall, on April 17th, 2019, Singleton suffered a stroke while on a trip to Costa Rica and passed away 11 days later after being taken off life support at just 51 years old. His funeral was held in Los Angeles about a week later where dozens of actors, artists, crew, and colleagues he worked with paid tribute to him. He not only left behind his seven children, but a lasting legacy on cinema that has inspired and influenced all manner of black creatives. From his predecessors like Spike Lee to those who have come after, like Jordan Peele, Ava DuVernay, Ryan Coogler, Boots Riley, Barry Jenkins, Donald Glover, and yes, even Tyler Perry. And you know what? I may just be a small channel here on YouTube, but I'm gonna throw myself in there as well because that's how truly influential this man was. Encouraging people to chase their dreams and flex their creativity is nothing to scoff at. I think it's admirable and uplifting. He used his voice to show people like me that dreams are worth chasing even if you don't see immediate success. He proved that if you had something to say, you could be heard by blazing your own trail. He inspired a generation. And that is the everlasting cinematic legacy of John Singleton. Whew, this was long and my voice is fried, but if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. If you want to help me get out of the YouTube hood, you can like and subscribe if you are filling the video and leave a comment letting me know what your favorite John Singleton project is and why. In the meantime, you can follow me over on socials, links in the description. Hopefully Twitter won't cave in on itself and I'll be back with more content soon. I'm Josh Fleeks. Till next time, y'all be easy.